Amen. Thank you for that, ladies. That was beautiful. Well, if you'll take your Bibles tonight and turn to the book of Matthew, chapter number 1. Matthew, chapter number 1. We've been in the book of Luke last couple of weeks, and we'll be back there next week. Uh, and probably also look a little bit in Matthew next week as well. But uh, tonight, we're going to be in Matthew, chapter number 1. We've been talking about some of the characters in the great uh, story, the great account of the birth of Christ. And uh, we talked about Zacharias. And then this morning we talked about Mary. Tonight we're going to talk about Joseph. Uh, and title this message, Joseph, God's Man. Joseph, God's Man. And in Matthew chapter number 1 and verse number 18, it says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. And uh, I've always uh, loved that introduction uh, to the passage there when he says the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. Matthew is writing and uh, saying, I know you're interested about the birth of Christ and, and uh, all that went on there. And so I'm going to tell you how that happened. Amen. And, um, you know, uh, the early church didn't really celebrate his birth that much. It was more about the resurrection. Amen. And that's still what we celebrate. That's why we're here today, literally today on Sunday, because of his resurrection. Uh, but eventually that did kind of catch on. And, and But Matthew said, hey, I know you want to know about the details of the birth of Christ. And so he gives his account, as Luke does as well. Uh, but we're going to focus a little more here on Joseph in this passage. Let's pray. We'll look at this. Father, again, we thank you for your word. We pray that you bless the reading of it and then help us as we uh, dig into it, Lord, to see what you have for us there. And Lord, as you uh, look down and not only chose Mary, but chose this man Joseph as well uh, for this great deed, Lord, you would choose us and use us in great ways as well. And so I pray that we would take some, uh, some lessons uh, from his response to this call and uh, Lord, that we might be obedient in our life as well. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to look a little bit about Joseph. First of all, regarding his beloved. You know, we talked about Mary this morning. And uh, we often think about Mary and think about uh, all that she went through and, and what kind of a you know, a, a shocking message it was for her, uh, but we don't usually think too much about Joseph. He just kind of along for the ride there. Uh, but of course, this was, this was going to be a great impact on his life as well. And so we're going to look a little bit about that, uh, and we'll start off with something we talked about this morning, the fact that they were espoused. So look again at verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph. So as we learn in the story of Mary, espousal is the second step in the, uh, in the um, Jewish marriage custom. Uh, so first it was simply announced that they were going to be married. Again, that was oftentimes prearranged, uh, and that was kind of, a, kind of like a, what we have here when a couple gets engaged. But then there was the espousal, and it was a legal contract. They were legally bound together. It usually lasted for about a year uh, before they were actually married. And the only way that could be broken was by divorce, and usually that was only in the case of immorality. And so they are in that instance there. They are espoused together. Um, and so, it, you know, it was common in that part of the world, again, that marriages were prearranged. You know, it was, it was thought to be too important of a decision to be left to young people who they were going to marry. And so th this is a very important thing. You're not old enough to understand. We'll, we'll decide who you're going to marry. And a lot of times families would get together and say, hey, we've had a daughter. We've had a son. Let's, uh, let's have them get married. Now, we don't know if that was the case with Mary and Joseph. The Bible doesn't tell us. There's a good chance that it was. Uh, but either way, we see that Joseph is willing to take responsibility. Joseph's going to be a family man. Uh, he has determined that he's going to marry his, uh, his love here. And they're going to have, hopefully one day, I'm sure they're hoping to have a family together. And, uh, of course, we know that he was a carpenter, so he was a hardworking man, and he was one who provided for his family. And he said, hey, I'm going to, I'm going to do this. We're going to be together. And, of course, marriage is, a, is something that God invented, and it's a wonderful thing. God created it, and he blessed it. And so we just see, and we may 
think of this as just a simple thing. Well, of course they were going to get together. But remember, we're looking at Joseph here, kind of putting a spotlight on him and his character a little bit. This is not a man that's running around wild out there and doesn't want to be tied down to anybody. He realizes that, hey, I need to settle down and, and I want to provide for someone and, and I want to be prepared. And they're in this espousal period here. But, but you know, Joseph was not an extraordinary man. He was just an ordinary man. Again, like Mary, you'd probably walk right past him on the street if you were there in first century and, and uh, not think anything about him. But there was something special about him that God saw. He was faithful. He was a faithful man. And that's what God wants. So often we look at the big people. We talked about uh, Pastor Sexton. And, you know, you can look at all the ministries that he's done. But the fact is the reason that God used him to such a great degree was not that he was special in any way, but simply he was faithful. I've heard him tell many times when he worked with, with uh, Dr. Robertson that Dr. Robertson gave him the bus ministry. And he said, I want you to take this and you be the head of the bus ministry. You know anything about uh, their bus ministry? It was huge. It was a massive ministry. And he took that over and he said, man, I did everything to the best of my ability. I worked so hard in that. And uh, he became Dr. Robertson's right-hand man for a long time. And we see in his college and in his ministry, he would tell people, hey, work hard for the Lord. And I remember many times we would have uh, the Shepherd's Summit. It was a Zoom call that for a long time it was every week. Uh, and then it went to once a month. About 1,500 pastors around the, the country, around the world, would get on this Zoom call. And Dr. Sexton would sit there for anywhere from a half hour to an hour and just talk about the ministry and talk about serving the Lord and talk about things. And man, so many times he would, he'd get on there and he, he'd kind of get upset. He'd say, get up and do something. <laughs> he said, don't just sit there. Be busy for the Lord. Do something for God. And so he was just faithful, and God blessed that faithfulness. And we can say that about so many other great men of God. They were just simply faithful. And here Joseph, he's not anyone, uh, you know, we only read about him just a little bit. And by the time the Lord starts his ministry, we don't read any more about him. Scholars believe he had probably passed away by then. But the short amount of time that we see him on the page of Scripture, we see he was a faithful man. And so we see that he was espoused. He was willing to be a family man and to take care of his family. But not only that, not only were they espoused, they were pure. Again, verse 18, he says his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph before they came together. Now, I know it's not very common for people to save themselves for marriage today, and there is no stigma attached to people living together and engaging in immorality, but the fact is temptation has always been a struggle, uh, especially for young people that are getting close to marriage. But we have a glimpse here into the character of Mary and Joseph. They wanted to do things the right way, God's way. And again, we don't need to just pass over this. We, we know this account so well that we just kind of pass over these details. But we're building a picture of character in this young man. And we're beginning to see why God chose him to be the earthly father, the stepfather, if you will, of his son. So we see that they were espoused and they were pure, but they were also troubled. Again, verse 18, he says, Before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Again, I know it's not a big deal to most people today, a single woman having a baby, uh, but, you know, it ought to be. <laughs> it, it's not progressive. It's not a better way of looking at things. It's sin. Amen? And at this time, it was considered scandalous for an unwed woman to be with child. But that was the case they found them in. I just think of that again. We know the end of the story, so we just kind of pass over that. But for her to be found with child before they came together, that was a scandal. It was serious. And by the way, notice also it says she was found with child. In other words, as we'd say today, she was showing. It was obvious that she was going to have a baby. And everybody knew that she and Joseph were not married yet. This was a scandal at this time. There was no way to hide it. So Mary and Joseph have a problem. You know, it would naturally be assumed that either Mary had been unfaithful to Joseph or that they had been immoral. And either way, it would have been hard for them to show their face in public. Again, today, nobody cares. They don't think anything about that. That's wrong. That's not the way it should be, but that's the case it is today. But it certainly was not that way then. Back then, people would look at that and they'd say, hey, something's wrong here. This, they have been immoral. And listen, 
uh, they could have suffered some consequences because of this. Hey, Joseph, remember, he's a, he's a businessman. He's a carpenter. He could have lost business because of this. People could have said, we don't want to have anything to do with them. They've been immoral. Or he's going to marry this immoral girl. We don't want to have anything to do with him. We don't know. But, you know, just because God is calling us to do something doesn't mean it's going to be easy. A lot of people think, well, God's called me to do something. I've surrendered to the will of God, so it's going to be smooth sailing from here on out. <laughs> no, as a matter of fact, it might get a lot rougher <laughs> once you surrender to the Lord. For one reason, you've got an enemy that's coming against you now. <laughs> And also serving the Lord most of the time is going against the grain of culture. And so it may be tough, but it doesn't matter. We don't determine whether we ought to serve God or not by how difficult it is. If God has called us to do something, we're to do it regardless of the level of difficulty. We are to obey. So we see that uh, regarding his beloved, they were espoused, they were pure, but they were troubled. And then we see some information here regarding his own honor. You know, Joseph is suddenly faced with a serious problem. But look at verse number 19. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man. I don't pass over that. Uh, this doesn't just mean that he was honorable and a good man, but in our language, he was saved. You know what? He had trusted the Messiah who was to come. Just like everyone else who had been saved before Christ, he looked ahead to the Messiah that would come, the Lamb of God, for his salvation. He was a just man. He was justified. You know, God uses people to do things that we would never imagine. His people. God uses his people to do great things. Many people look at the Christian life from the outside and say, man, that must be a boring life. You don't get to do, do much or have much fun. But boy, somebody that's saved and has surrendered their life to the Lord and said, Lord, I'll do whatever you want me to do. And they honestly mean that. And God says, all right, I want you to step out and do this. And they do that. Boy, they learn this is an exciting life. And it is a fulfilling life. I'm doing something that I know will last a lifetime. Hey, you know, the fact is, unless the trumpet sounds first, you're going to die. <laughs> That's just a fact. They did a scientific study not too long ago. These eminent scientists probably spent a lot of government money on it. You know how they do. And they came up with this conclusion. Ten out of ten people die. <laughs> I'm kidding. They didn't really come up with that. But that's the case. That's the truth. Everybody dies. It's appointed unto men once to die. But after this, the judgment. And so when, when we get a little bit older and we start to think not just about the immediate, but we start to think a little bit in the future, we begin to think, hey, is my life going to count for anything? Is it going to mean anything? And people who are unsaved, they run around, they try to build up bank accounts and go and do all this and make their name popular and everything. So their life really means something. And in the end, that means nothing. But if you will serve the Lord and folks are saved and folks learn the word of God and are comforted and families are held together and things, at least in part because you have served the Lord and done what he's called you to do, then you've left a lasting legacy behind. And uh, God uses his people to do that. Think of that. God doesn't go out into the world and find people to do his work. Now he can use people, he can move, he can sway the hearts of the king to do something, but when he wants to get his work done, he moves on the heart of his people to do that. And the fact here that it says that he was just, he was a just man, we see that God is using another one of his people. Hey, I, I wonder, has, has God moved on your heart to do something? If you're his child, he's got something for you to do. There's no doubt about it. And so he was a just man. But not only that, he was a good man. Look at verse number 19. Again, then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example. You know, by law, Joseph could have called Mary out in public and told everyone that she had obviously been unfaithful to him. But the Bible says that he was not willing to make her a public example. You know, we need more men who care more about others than about themselves. Now, like I said, this could affect him. If he's seen in public with her, then it could have come down on him. But he said, you know what, I, I, I'm not going to make her a public example. He could have come up, I want everybody to know uh, that I am innocent in this and I have not done anything wrong and I want you to know that and she's wicked. And she, He could have done that legally. And what would have happened, the society would have said, okay, Joseph, you're, you're innocent. We trust you and, and get this woman out of here. We can't, but he could have done that, but he was not willing to do that. 
He said, I'm willing to take uh, some of this on myself rather than to put that on her. And also he was discreet. Again, verse number 19, not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. Now, the putting away is the writing of a divorce. Basically, the man would give the woman a document stating that their espousal was broken and she was then free to be espoused to another. And Joseph at first believed that she must have been unfaithful and that he needed to end the relationship, but he wanted to do it privately. And this, is, this was very common at the time. If they saw, they'd say, well, the, you know, the, obviously this is over. She apparently doesn't love me like I thought she did, and, and we need to end this. And that's what the espousal time was for. Literally, the reason it lasted a year was to wait and make sure that they had both been faithful. And so he could have privately written this document and given her that, and it would have been quiet, and she could have gone on. And that's what he is thinking about. But he's trying to be discreet. Even when we can assume that he thought that she had been unfaithful to him, even then he still wants to protect her and protect her reputation and do all that he can. Are you beginning to see a picture of what this man was like, this man Joseph? He's a godly man. He's one that God chose specifically for this role. And then we see his revelation, verse number 20. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> now that's, a, that's an amazing revelation, isn't it? Just imagine that. You know, surely Mary had told him uh, this, but he apparently didn't believe it. And who would blame him? It's never happened before <laughs> that, a, that a virgin has been with child. And so he apparently didn't believe it. But notice that the Bible says that while he thought on these things. You know God knows your thoughts. He knows what you're thinking. So he's just thinking, you know what I'm going to have to do. I'm going to have to break this off. But I'm going to do it privately. I don't want to drag her out into public. He's just thinking these things. But God knows what he's thinking. And he sends the angel to talk to him. God knows our thoughts. He knows our concerns. And he can bring comfort by answering our questions or by simply reminding us that he will never leave us nor forsake us. Have you ever wondered, I wonder if God knows what I'm going through. A lot of times we're going through things privately. Nobody has any idea in our mind. We're thinking things and we don't know what to do. And we wonder, does anybody know? God knows our thoughts. He knows what's going on. And the ministry of the Holy Spirit is to bring comfort and to bring counsel and to bring conviction if needed. And by the way, he does that through his word. You wonder why some people uh, that are saved, as far as you know they're saved, but they're out doing things that are not right. And you think, man, don't they know they're not supposed to do that? Well, the fact is they may not know it because they hadn't studied the word of God. <laughs> and the word of God shows us what God expects of us. He shows us how to be faithful and how to serve him. And the Holy Spirit can, can pull out of the well within us those things that we've put there. The word of God, he can bring that up and help us. And you're going through a tumultuous time in your mind. You're thinking, you're worried about these things. And the Holy Spirit can bring to mind things that he's taught you through his word. Now, of course, at this time, the Word of God was not complete yet, and so God was still speaking through visions and things like that. And so he comes to him. He sends the angel of the Lord to him, and he tells him uh, not to worry. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David. He reminds him, hey, you're of the royal line. Hey, God knows who you are. You know, you know God doesn't need uh, 23 and me or... Uh, you know, the, uh, the thing you send in to find out your ancestor, ancestry.com. He doesn't need any of that. He knows exactly who we are, where we're from. By the way, there's Jews all over the world. God knows who they are, where they're from. He knows where all the tribes of Israel are at. Amen. And he knew who Joseph was. Like I said this morning, the, you might have passed by Mary's house and not think anything about it, not realize the daughter of the king is in there. And you might have passed by, by uh, Joseph's carpenter shop in there and see him in there sawing on some wood or hammering a nail and never thought to yourself, hey, that's the son of David there. That, that's the, the, the descendant of the king, but God knew though. So he knows us. He knows what we're going through. And he says, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And so God is assuring him it's okay 
to take her to be your wife. Like I said, he not only chose Mary, he chose Joseph as well. And may I say, when God chooses someone for a ministry, it's a package deal. <laughs> if God chooses a man to go into missions, he's chosen the wife as well. Too many times the wives say, well, he chose you, not me. I'm not going there, and there's a problem there. <laughs> hey, when God moves on a family, he moves them together. God doesn't want family split up. He wants them to serve together. And he looks at Joseph, and he, he, he's chosen Mary, but he chose, chooses Joseph as well. And I believe, you know, like I said, this may have been a prearranged marriage. We don't know, but I can tell you this. It was prearranged in the annals of time <laughs> because God said that man and that woman are going to come together, and my son is going to be born to her, and he's going to be the stepfather of my son. And we can see why. So then we see some instruction he's given. Joseph has given some instruction. It may have seemed simple, but anything God calls us to do is important, and we are expected to be faithful. First of all, he would be a father. Look at verse 21. And she shall bring forth a son. You know, this is something that most men want in their lives, to, to be a father. And we all want to pass on our knowledge and experience and our love to another generation. I mean, it was no different then. But it was even more serious. It was considered a curse to not have children. We've talked about that many times, about Abraham and others where they couldn't have children. And that was that people, women were looked down on because of that. And so they really wanted to have a child. It was really important for them. And he's going to be a father. So he was surely excited about the news that he's going to be a father. But I can tell you, as a father, when you find out that news, boy, it's, it's, it's heavy. <laughs> it hits you, and you're like, oh, man, I, I, I've, got, I've got more responsibility now. And most, most men that are fathers are young men, <laughs> and they think to themselves, man, I ain't got life figured out myself yet. How am I going to teach this child these things? But that's why a family uh, needs to be together. They both need to be saved and serving the Lord and come together. And the Holy Spirit can work in that and can help the father and the mother to raise their children as they should. No parent's going to be perfect. We're all going to make mistakes. But the Lord can work through us and, and do these things that we can't do on our own. And I'm sure it was something for him to think, man, I'll, you know, he, he's, like, he's thinking, we're still making wedding plans. And now I find out I'm going to be a father. Man, this is, this is a lot to take in. But he learns he's going to be a father. And then he learns that he will name him. Look, uh, look again, verse 21. He shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. Well, we talked about the name this morning, the fact that it was a fairly common name at the time, but once it is attached to the Son of God, it loses all its commonality. Amen. It's not common anymore. As we said, the sweetest name I know. Amen. And so he's told, this is what you're going to name him. And why would he name him that? Again, verse 21, for he shall save his people from their sins. Amen. Jesus, Jehovah saves. God is our Savior. You know, names in the Bible are always important. And oftentimes a name is changed. God will change someone's name uh, for good or bad. I talked about Jeconiah this morning, uh, the son of David, who was a very wicked king. And uh, he, was, he was told that he would not have any descendants that would sit on the throne of David. And later, uh, I think, believe it's Jeremiah is talking about him, and he calls him Coniah. And it's a, it's a derisive term. It's looking down on him because of how wicked he was. And, of course, we know other times names are changed for good reasons. Abram is changed to Abraham. Saul becomes Paul. and Cephas becomes Peter and so on and so forth. So names have very important uh, meanings in the Bible. And even names that, that were not changed later, we find out they, they really mean something. Methuselah, when uh, after this it shall come and the flood comes uh, just after he dies. And, but the name Jesus is more important than any of those. And he was more perfectly named than anyone has ever been. God does save, and he saves through this one named Jesus. And so he's going to name him, and he's going to have this great responsibility. Now, it's a wonderful truth that he's been told that his son's going to be the savior of the world, but think of the great responsibility that all of a sudden comes on Joseph. Of course, Jesus was slain from the foundation of the world, and he was prophesied to be the Messiah and the Savior. That was going to happen. But it still must have been a heavy burden on Joseph to know that the long-awaited Messiah was to be his son. 
Every Jewish boy and girl grew up hearing the stories and hearing that Messiah would come one day. That's one of the reasons that every woman wanted to have a child and specifically wanted to have a boy. And you can go back and read when women in the Bible have a boy, how excited they are about that. Because they all thought, hey, maybe this will be the Messiah. Maybe this is the one. And now Joseph has been told, your child will be the one. Well, that's exciting, but also a great responsibility. Amen. Think of that. God certainly does call ordinary people to do extraordinary things. And then we see a little note on prophecy that Matthew, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, has given us in verses 22 and 23. It says, Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Of course, that's Isaiah 7, 14, and we talked about that this, uh, this morning. Uh, but notice, though, uh, Matthew takes a moment to remind us that this had all been prophesied. Hey, that just reminds us God keeps his promise. Amen. <laughs> it doesn't matter how long it's been. It's been hundreds of years, thousands of years. It doesn't matter. God always keeps his promise. And we've talked about the astronomically low chance of Jesus fulfilling all of these prophecies, but he would, and he would fulfill them to the letter. And Joseph gets to be a part of this. By the way, think of this. So, all through the centuries, it's been told the Messiah is coming, the Messiah is coming, the Messiah is coming. And all the Jews, they've heard of this and said, man, when, when will the Messiah come? Maybe our child will be the Messiah. Who will be the Messiah? All of a sudden, Joseph finds out that his son will be the Messiah. So now he is a part of this great prophecy. Just think of that. I mean, you, th you think of prophecies that you've heard and all of a sudden find out you're a part of that. Well, guess what? You are. God told Abraham that all nations of the earth would be blessed through his descendants. He's talking about Jesus, who would be born through his line. But do you know how all nations of the earth will be blessed? By you doing your part. When we give to missions and when we witness to people and, and give out tracts and bring people to church, we are being a part of that prophecy of all people being blessed through Abraham's seed. We get to be a part of that prophecy as well. In other words, God uses people to do his work. Just simple, ordinary people. And by the way, something else to remember here. As long as it had been since Isaiah made that prophecy and it was fulfilled, just remember, God said, the Lord said, I'm coming back. He said, if I go, I will return. And just like he kept his promise then, he'll keep his promise one day he's coming back. Amen? We can be assured of that. And then we see some notes here regarding his response to this. Uh, notice first, he acted immediately. Uh, verse number 24, the first part, Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him. Notice he didn't hesitate to do what God had called him to do. You know, we need to learn not only to obey, but to do so immediately. We're supposed to do it immediately. Remember the little song, Obedience is the very best way to show that you believe? And he said, doing it happily and immediately, right away. That's what we're to do. You know, when, when we tell our children to do something, we expect them to do it right away. That's no different with God. When God tells us to do something, he expects us to get busy about it and do it. Now, there are times of waiting. And sometimes God com God's command is, you're going to do this, but right now you're to wait. You remember when the Lord ascended, he told the disciples, he said, now you go to Jerusalem and you wait. You wait for the Holy Spirit to come and empower you. And so while they were waiting, they were being obedient. Even though they weren't up and active in doing things, that was obedience because he told them to wait. And so sometimes his command is to wait. And when we wait, we are being obedient. But other times it says, okay, now it's time to go. And God expects us to get up and go. There's a lot of people that have been putting off obeying God for a long time. And you know, the longer you put it off, the easier it is to do. And the longer you will put it off. I've heard of people that, that say, you know what? The Lord called me a long time ago to be a missionary. And I didn't do it. And now they're at a place in their life where they just can't do that. They're serving God in a different way. They're in his permissive will, and he's using them, but it's not his perfect will. And it's not what he would have had for them. And that can be true in, in so many things. And it can be something small. Maybe he's put on your heart to, to witness to somebody. And you said, okay, maybe next time I see them. Hey, you don't know if there will be a next time. You know, maybe down, maybe later on. No, when God calls to do something, we need to do it immediately. 
And you notice what it says? It says, then Joseph being raised from sleep. <laughs> he's sound asleep and he gets this vision of God. He wakes up and he says, all right, God said do it. I'm going to do it. Right away, he, he acted immediately. And then he acted obediently again in verse 24. Then Joseph being raised from sleep did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him. You know, that's all obedience is, just doing what you're told to do. Sometimes we think it's so uh, complicated. Boy, I, I don't know, I've got to really study and see what God wants. Hey, oftentimes it's just one step in front of the other. You know, some people sit back and they say, well, once God really writes it in the sky and tells me his great plan, then I'll get busy in serving God. Well, he's never going to do that. First of all, he doesn't write anything in the sky. He writes it in his word. Amen. Uh, but secondly, he's never going to give you the grand plan until you're obeying then the little things. What is it he wants you to do right now? And if we're not obedient in the small things, he's never going to give us the big things to do. But we are to be obedient, and it's just doing what God has called us to do. So he acted immediately, and he acted obediently, and then he acted lovingly. Look again at verse 24. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife. As he took Mary to be his wife, he certainly would have comforted her and assured her that he knew that she was telling the truth and that they were going to serve God together. Now get this picture in your mind as I've showed you. Put your mind back in first century Israel there and what it would have been like for all of a sudden this girl who's unmarried to show up and, and she's pregnant, she's going to have a baby. And then to hear, well, you hear what the story is they said? Some angel appeared to them and said she's going to have the Messiah. Oh yeah, right. And then Joseph, what does he do? He comes up, he puts his arm around, he says, I believe you and I'm going to be with you. Hey, we're going to go through this together. He acts lovingly toward her. You know what a lot of people would have done? Said, hey, I don't want anything to do with that. I'm not going to raise the Messiah. I'm not going to marry this girl that says an angel said God came on her and, and, and going to have a baby. I don't know about it. I'm out of here. No, it shows how much he loved her. And love has to be the foundation of a great marriage and a great family and to serve God together. And we see that he acted lovingly toward her. And then we see his obedience finally. Verse number 25. First of all, he restrained himself. He says, and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn. As we said, he restrained his natural desires so that God's will could be done. Notice, what is he doing? He's putting himself last again. This is what a real man does. We're told in the world today, a real man goes out and gets what he wants. Nobody gets in his way. No, a real man says, Lord, what do you want? And Lord, I'm going to put myself last. And Lord, my family needs something, and I'm going to make sure they get it over me. And I'm going to put my desires last. And we see that about he restrained himself. Then we see he loved his wife. Again, verse 25, and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son. You get that? Knew her not till... She brought forth her firstborn son. After Jesus is born, Mary and Joseph enter into a normal marriage relationship. She was not a perpetual virgin. She had children. The Bible's very clear. Jesus had half brothers and sisters. And they were not cousins, by the way, which the Catholics will try and tell you. The word that's used for them literally means brothers and sisters. And so they entered into a normal relationship. He loved her. So he restrained himself, he loved his wife, and then finally, notice at the end of the verse, he says, and called his name Jesus. Hey, what, what did the angel tell him to do? Call his name Jesus. What did he do? He called his name Jesus. Well, what's the big deal? Well, number one, it's a big deal because he was obedient. Again, obedience is often so simple that we look at it and think, well, what's the big deal? But to God, it's always a big deal when we're obedient. But number two, notice this child's going to be the Messiah. Don't you think he was tempted to name him Joseph? <laughs> hey, I want everybody to know he's my child. He's going to be the Messiah. Let's call him Joseph. But no, he said, you want him to be named Jesus? We'll name him Jesus. And of course, we know that uh, down through the ages, Mary is the one that we talk about the most. And because she has more of the account, as far as we know, she lived a lot longer and, and everything. Joseph doesn't get a lot of the spotlight, but he's the kind of man that doesn't need that. All he needs to know is that God has called him to do something and he is obedient to and he's obedient and he is willing to do what God's called him to do. Very simply, he is faithful. It's required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Not that a man be found talented, or that a man be found wealthy, or that a man be found powerful, just that a man be found faithful. And you talk about a steward, who is 
ever been a greater steward than the one that God chose to be the earthly father of the Messiah. And like I said, yes, Jesus was God. He was perfect. I, I promise you, they never had, literally never had a moment's problem out of Jesus. Amen. <laughs> but still, it's a great burden on him, a great responsibility that he has the Messiah, the Savior of the world there in his home for however long it was. We know at least for 12 years. We don't know how much longer after that. And yet, and he says, hey, I'm just a common, ordinary man. I'm just a carpenter. That's all I am. I don't know what I can do. I'm not a great scholar. I can't teach him all these. I don't know all these things. But God says, I've chosen you. He chose Mary. We saw this morning she was blessed among women. We saw that uh, she, there was grace extended to her. She was a godly young lady. And he chose Joseph. And we see that he is a faithful man. He's a good man. He's a just man. And he brings them together. Hey, here's a question tonight. Uh, number one, are you, are you anything special? <laughs> you know, we're, we're all special because God gave his son to die for us, amen? But the fact is, compared to anybody else, we're just like anyone else. But does that hinder us from being used of God? Not, of all, not at all. Ordinary people who are willing, and by the way, you know, if God chooses to use someone who has great intellect and great wealth and power and all that, that's fine, but you know what? That person's probably going to get the glory for it. And uh, Now, they're good, godly men and women that have great wealth and great power, and, and they're, they do a great job of giving the glory to God, but that's very, very rare. But you know someone who doesn't have any of that, just an ordinary person, and God uses them, who gets the glory? God gets the glory, amen? So as we continue to unfold this great story, we see the characters in place, just ordinary people, but God uses them because they're faithful. Father, we thank you for this beautiful story, Lord, and we thank you for this man, Joseph. We don't know a lot about him, but your, your word records a lot about his character here in just these short passages. And we thank you, Lord, that you found a man who was godly and was willing to be faithful and obedient, and Lord, you were able to use him. And Lord, we don't know each of us all of your plans in our life, but we know you have something for us to do. And we're glad to know that all we have to do is be obedient and be faithful, and you can use us. I pray you'd help us to be surrendered to you in Jesus' name. Let's stand together for a moment. We have a verse of invitation. Maybe you want to come and kneel at an altar and just say, Lord, I just want to be faithful. I want to be obedient. Whatever you've called me to do, All right, thank you so much. You can look this way. There's a lot to this story, amen? Uh, and um, we're looking forward to next week. We're going to go to Bethlehem next week, amen, and see, what, uh, see this beautiful story again. Boy, it's probably one we know better than just about any story, amen, but there's always more for us to see and to learn and let the Lord do in our hearts, amen? Well, remember the prayer request that we mentioned. Keep everyone in your prayer, especially Brother Louis. As he uh, gets some uh, information this week and, and begins to make a plan there. And uh, to keep all of those in your prayers. And let's plan to be back together on Wednesday night. Amen.